All right. Well, my name is Melissa Waters, and I'm the manager of events and programs here at JMT Consulting. I want to thank you again for joining us for our expert speaker series. We have Lucretia Gilbert and Rebecca Wasserman joining us uh, for virtual event winning strategies, maximizing fundraising success now. Uh, just a couple things, and then I'm going to turn it over to them. This webinar is sponsored by JMT Consulting, and uh, for those that are new, we are an ERP and financial management solutions firm with 30 years experience uh, and specialize in nonprofits. Uh, at any time today, if you have a question, please make sure you submit that in the Q&A box on your control panel. We are also recording this webinar, and we will send you a copy of the recording along with the slides. Uh, I do want to introduce Lucretia and Rebecca, and then I'm going to turn it over to them. So Lucretia is the principal and founder of the Philanthropy Advantage and was the former philanthropy officer for the Breast Cancer Research Foundation. She's a seasoned development professional. Sorry, I can't read today. She's a seasoned development professional and innovative leader. Uh, she is a high impact philanthropy consulting firm that provides strategy and implementation support for nonprofits, private foundations, individuals, and corporations. She is currently consulting with the Elton John AIDS Foundation. We also have Rebecca, Man Rebecca Wasserman joining us today. She's the Man Managing Director of Development and Regional Events for the Breast Cancer Research Foundation. Uh, she oversees fundraising initiatives across the country. She partners with sponsors, donors, and volunteer leadership in Boston, Palm Beach, Westchester, and Long Island markets, responsible for nearly $5 million in revenue annually. She has successfully executed several virtual events varying in scale over the last year, working hand-in-hand -hand with leading technology and production partners. We are happy to have Rebecca and Lucretia, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to them. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you. Sorry, I had to unmute there. <laughs> well, we're so glad to be here. Um, Rebecca and I are delighted to be with you all this afternoon. So thank you for taking the time to join us. We know there are many uh, seasoned fundraisers, uh, event planners, and financial mavens on this call, and industry leaders across the sector. So, so thank you for being with us. I think on the kind of the first slide of the presentation, we just want to really set the stage for kind of how our evolution began in virtual fundraising. And I think it's kind of prudent to take a step back and think back to March of 20, 2019, okay, actually 2020, it feels like years ago, um, <laughs> that we all headed home to work remotely, which we thought would be for a temporary period of time. And little did we know what we were embarking upon at that time. What was before us, and I'm sure many of you in the nonprofit world, was what to do with our fundraising events that were that spring 2020 season. We had two big um, fundraisers, um, one that was scheduled to be in Boston in April and one in New York City that was scheduled to be in May. Given that it was March um, and the ramp up time to alter the April event was not quite adequate, we decided the best route would be to delay that event into the fall of 2020, as I'm sure many of you might have postponed some events and little do we know what we were in store for. But for our very large May event, which was our flagship fundraiser, we decided to go ahead and pivot to the virtual format. We didn't have as, many, as much time as we'd like, but we had about six to eight weeks. Um, we had never produced a virtual event before as a foundation. We typically did large galas um, in venue spaces, as I'm sure many of you have done the like. And so what we thought we'd do initially was kind of tap into our resources who are the best event planning resource partners that we have, who are fundraising experts that we've worked with in the past, and really, really wanted to survey other nonprofits, make a highly informed decision about what we were embarking upon and take a temperature gauge across the sector. We were seeing that some events were postponing, like I mentioned, either to the summer or to the fall, and some were embarking upon this virtual world. So we thought we'd dive right in. So after watching a few events, which were kind enough of our nonprofit friends and some event planners to invite us to other events to watch, we looked for what type of content they were producing. Was it pre-recorded? Was it live? Was the platform easy to navigate? What was the donor experience, the user experience? How were you interacting with the platform when you logged in? Was it easy and was it challenging? And then also, what is your ability to donate? I think that's the most important thing for us as fundraisers is how do you raise money throughout the content of the show and what did that look like? 
I think one of the things that kind of really stepped out at us was there was a range of content being produced. Some events looked a little more polished, some were a little more homegrown. And I think we all knew just that by the nature of it, we were all doing the best we could under the circumstances. But what we realized at that point in time was, yes, we were fundraisers. Yes, we produced large shows and events, but we never really produced something for the medium of the screen of a virtual event. So we decided to bring in an executive producer, a very low budget executive producer, but someone who had previously worked on translating Broadway shows from the stage to film. And that we thought would be kind of what we were trying to tackle of bringing a live event content to the screen and able to hold the guest's attention, engage the guest and hopefully motivate the guest uh, to stay and watch the entire event. So that's just kind of like how we kind of initially launched into this and how we surveyed our, our landscape before we dove right in. And I'll let Rebecca kind of talk to you about the other layer of this, which is the platform. Thanks, Lucretia. So we learned relatively quickly that there were varying degrees of tech immersion that we could take here. So everything as simple as the Zoom that we're all used to today, being able to see each other to advanced you know, virtual reality and having personalized avatars, or even something as simple as using a browser, logging onto a YouTube page and, and clicking play. The most important thing for us was that the platform was user friendly and that it was accessible to our donors and our attendees. Uh, the other thing that we were really mindful of was security. We, it was a priority for us to keep the event stream private for supporters and guests only and not open to the public. Capturing data and analytics was also a priority because it would then help us inform future events. We wanted to take the learnings and the information from that first event and use it for the future. So using an email address as a unique identifier to log in, having a login time and a log out time could then help us assess our programming. Was there a lull in the program, programming? Was there a point that was super boring or super compelling? We wanted to gather as much information as we could, including also the devices and the browsers that our constituents were using. At the time, given that this was the beginning of the COVID era, having access to the IP addresses also gave us the information of where everyone was during that time as well, which was an interesting thing for us to be thinking about. Um, as Lucretia mentioned, the other thing that was really a priority for us was the ability for our donors to donate during the event and making that sure that that functionality was as smooth and as simple for everyone as possible. So making sure that folks didn't have to leave the page to donate, making it a simple process for them, building within that functionality a strong, compelling app in our program and really tapping into the mindset of the donor of what compels them to give and how can we make that as streamlined as possible for them at this time. So as we talk about content, back to you, Lucretia. Thanks, Rebecca. So I think one of the other elements of this is content production. And I know also important for the finance folks on the call is how do you budget for a, finance, for a, a virtual event? So I think some of the elements that we took into consideration as we forecasted first coming off the heels of our first virtual event experiment, I would say, and then preparing for what was us, a very large fall virtual event season where we had six virtual events on the horizon. So here's what we did, I guess, from the beginning is we started to inventory our current video assets. What do we have in the archives? Are there any, is there mission related content? Is there a terrific testimonial of a patient or a grateful recipient of our services that we could either reuse or that we could repackage, which it's always more cost effective to use content you have versus reinventing new content. Now, some of you might not have had content or might not. And so you might embark upon creating content, which we had to do after we used all of our stock content for May, we had to now embark upon new content for the fall. And one of the smart things we did was we partnered very closely with our communications area. And we talked with them about what was in their budget and what was in their forecasting of assets that they needed for other types of media communications. And so did they need a PSA, a 30 second or a 15 second? So together we actually filmed a mission related testimonial for the virtual event that was 60 seconds, but then we're able to splice it down to a 30 and 15 second version for our PSA for other purposes. So I do think there's ways to kind of maximize the ROI on the content you're creating. And just to think a little bit out of the box of if you create something, could it be for your year-end video appeal? You know, what else can you use these assets for 
things that can be evergreen, I think the donors don't always remember it as much as we think they do. So um, I think there's always a little bit of positive recycling that can be done. The next piece is we thought about our sponsors. When we were dealing with our event that was initially in May, we had already had some sponsors locked in. And we wanted to think about some opportunities to go to them with since they were gonna lose some of the on-site visibility that they had come to receive in the past. So we did allow our top, top sponsors, we're talking about two to three maximum high level sponsors for the C-level executive to give like a 30 or 60 second speech, I guess, for lack of better words, a message about why their organization was supporting the cause. And these executives really loved it. They loved an opportunity to say X and X brand is so proud to be affiliated with this organization and here's why. Um, or we allowed them to make like a little sh short kind of like commercial animated piece about their company that kind of served as like a commercial break, um, which was nice as well. So you wanna make sure it's in line with your content and doesn't feel too commercial. But I think there's a way to bring some sincerity to it if you can work with them on script writing, but it's a great way to raise some significant money from your top sponsors. Another piece is kind of taking a hold of your internal and external stakeholders that need to be a part of the actual video. Are there certain board members that need to speak? Do you have an ambassador for the organization that is a celebrity? Do you know your CEO? Who, who does need to play a role in the event? Um, we kind of made an outline of our top 10 to 12 ideal speakers and then budgeted out a timeline accordingly so that when we went to our production partners to get quotes for budget purposes, they had an idea of what the show would look like. So I think that's a very easy thing to start with, kind of like you would do the same for an in-person event. And then where the costs kind of really come in is the cost of filming. So when you look at those stakeholders that you're interviewing or recording, what kind of high quality software do they have? Do they have a high iPhone? Do they have a webcam at home? What is their access and also proficiency with technology? I think that's important to take into consideration of who you're filming and how you're gonna film it as you create a budget. Something that we learned quickly was that some people might need a light ring. They might need like a tripod for their phone. Um, we did realize that you don't want the donors to look like they're reading from a piece of paper. So there are apps like teleprompter apps that you can either download on an iPad or you can have a company literally deliver an iPad with the teleprompter app and the script preloaded. Um, and we can give you some names of some firms that can do that and it's not expensive, but that way, at least if your board chair is reading something, it kind of is in a teleprompter format similar to they're used to when they're reading from presidential prompters at an event. And that was really helpful. And hopefully as the COVID restrictions um, as people get vaccinated, might loosen up a bit. Maybe someone might want a cameraman in their home, like one individual. That wasn't really possible for us in 2020, but it might be open-minded in the future for those of us that are considering budgeting for events in 2021. Um, next up, which is kind of the most expensive aspect of this is really the entertainment piece. And I think if you look at your timeline and you think about where there is mission-focused content, you also want it to be fun and entertaining and engaging. So, you know, are you able to get Broadway, local Broadway performers to join you? Um, you know, clearly Broadway is dark right now and many have been so generous to nonprofits and donating their time. But what comes with that is a sound mixer, a pianist, and then some more editing time for the lovely editing team that you bring on board to make sure that that piece is put together correctly. And that is also based on how many performers and if you do a large musical number, um, that'll cost a little bit more. And then again, I think it's the same with celebrity appearances. What would it cost to have that celebrity be on and be involved? And then, you know, just your entire pre recorded versus live elements. These, the individuals that are working with you from a production video editing point of view will need to know how much content roughly you need edited. And I think, you know, we will talk about this a little bit more later, but it is recommended from what we're seeing of best practices for the content to be roughly 45 minutes. Um, and there's always like a ramp up on that, but typically 45 minutes of actual show content is pretty much what we're seeing to be the max at this moment in time. And then lastly, that we also learned after the fact was it's important to secure the rights for the content, especially the musical elements, so that they can be reproduced, um, which is something that you'll have to do then work on legal rights to some of the music and the songs. Um, and you can also do that after the event, but ideally it's great to do it before. And now we'll go to the next slide. Thanks, Rebecca. 
So on this first slide that you'll see here, this was the first journey kind of of our virtual world here, which was back in May. And we did, uh, this is our typical gala, our gala format. We kind of changed the name of the event to a virtual hot pink evening. Um, it was previously a party, which we did not feel was the right tone at the time for May. Uh, as you can see for the numbers on the screen, in advance of the event, going into it on May 20th, we had $4.9 million. During the event, we raised $401,000. And the total event revenue was $5.3 million. So this was 86% of our budgeted goal pre-COVID. So we had budgeted this goal in June of 2019. And so this was what we had anticipated raising um, was roughly over $6 million and we hit 5.3. So we were pleasantly pleased with the outcome given the timeline. We had a thousand individuals in attendance. In the past at these galas, we probably had roughly eight to 900 people. So we were delighted to have an expanded virtual audience with us. We did maintain our table and ticket levels given that some of the money had been secured uh, prior to March. And then we also involved the text the pledge component, which was great for raising on-site money. I think the other important aspects of this is that it was a one-time broadcast. We played it at 8 p.m. Uh, also because of musical rights issues, but it was a one-time play, which got all of our supporters together at the same moment in time, which kind of increased engagement and lots of internal text messaging among our donors. As Rebecca had mentioned, we were really set on collecting analytics. It was really important for us in May to learn from what we were doing. Um, and so every individual had access via their email address. So two people could not register with the same email address. It was a unique email address registration process, which was also a learning experience. We played it on a private streaming platform. Uh, we did have a creative virtual lobby concept, which was kind of like a cocktail reception or your live carpet um, that you typically have, which had slides of our sponsors, as well as an interactive countdown clock. And then we had photos submitted of our donors as if they were kind of walking the carpet, but more at home. Um, and they submitted those photos to us and we had them kind of scrolling by um, on the bottom banner of the event so people could see themselves as they were logging in. And for May, that was about as interactive as we could get, but there's more interaction coming as we kind of continue on this. And so we were really pleased with this and we had some great partners and we can share with you any of our production and platform recommendations as we continue on. So now I'm gonna turn it over to you, Rebecca. Thanks, Lucretia. So BCRF is fortunate to have many dedicated donors and volunteers across our markets, as I'm sure many of you all do. We consider them one of our greatest assets. So each market has its own personality and we were hoping to take our learnings from the spring and implement those learnings into what worked for each region. Also, we were hoping to be mindful of the tenets of fundraising and what our motivators are during in-person events and thinking about how we can implement those motivators in a virtual way. So for our Long Island event, for example, which we're talking about here, one of the things that this group typically likes to do is have a unifying engaging theme, right? So it's a tool for engagement. It's a way to get folks excited. That in years past has been anything from a casino night to denim and diamonds, something fun, something that people can get excited about. So the fact that we were kind of leaning into the fact we were at, at home, the event was going to be virtual. We wanted to encourage folks to get comfortable and tune in for the program. So we played off this pajamas and pink theme, pink being of course for breast cancer. All of that being said, we had about 400,000 in advanced revenue, which is pretty comparable to what we've done in years past for in-person events. We raised 32,000 during the event, which again was very close to what we had done for in-room fundraising in years past, bringing our total revenue to over 432. We had 400 attendees, and this was really an opportunity for us to focus on and highlight community members and key human interest stories who we otherwise wouldn't have been able to highlight if we had been in person. So for example, we had a, a man who was the husband and a caregiver for his wife who was living with metastatic breast cancer research. We were able to highlight a longtime advocate who lost her mom to cancer, who had created a peer-to-peer -peer soccer fundraiser with her daughter and kids. It was an opportunity for us to think about our mission and also utilize the fact that this was virtual and we weren't confined by being in a ballroom on Long Island. 
That being said, we also were able to tap in some of our investigators from across the country, specifically from North Carolina and Boston, who were the recipients of funds raised from this very event for the last decade plus. So it was a wonderful opportunity to have them to record a piece. We were then able to feature it. And this community was able to hear from those doctors directly how the funds that they have helped raise, even though they were going to institutions in North Carolina and Boston, were then being able to be translated into real impact today. So um, we were able to see how those impact dollars, you know, played out even in a virtual way, which was, which was wonderful. Lucretia, if you want to talk to us about New York. Yeah, I think that's great. I think just to piggy off back what Rebecca is saying, you know, I think we all have such great missions and it's a really special time. And I, your donors are loyal to your missions. They give because they care. And so it's an opportunity to kind of bring your mission to life in a new way. And I know that's really resonating with our audience and a lot of the nonprofit events that we've seen, um, just the mission related content has been so engaging. Uh, so just continue to kind of champion your mission and package it uh, creatively, but it does resonate really well with the audience. So we were embarking upon the fall and we had a very large fundraising event. It is our largest luncheon that we do. Um, typically it was housed in New York City. We're fans of the Waldorf and we were at the Hilton Midtown as well. And so now we were heading virtual. And so in advance of this event, we did decide strategically to leave our table and ticket levels the same. I know others are deciding to lower their ticket prices based on their individual strategic goals for the organization. Um, our job is to get as much money into the hands of researchers so they can save lives right now. And so we thought we're going to hold, hold, our, hold our levels as they are and hope that our loyal retained donors will join and give at that level, and which we were pleasantly pleased they did. Um, we went into the event with an advanced revenue of $2.2 million. Uh, we raised $817,000 on site, which I will really dive into because this is where um, this is where this kind of secret sauce is. And then our total revenue was $3 million. The fascinating part about this, which we were astonished by as well, is that we actually exceeded our revenue goal for 2019. So I know people are afraid about pivoting. I know people... Um, are concerned about raising money virtually and it's not the same. I think if you really have loyal donors, donors that you've retained and stewarded really well, they want to champion your cause even during this time if they are able. And so we had more attendees at this event than we've ever had before. Over 1,100 people joined us from all around the globe, which was really special. It was a daytime event, so we kind of made the format relevant to the daytime. We had a Michelin star chef, Dominique Kren, who you can see from the screen. She is a breast cancer survivor and she did a demo of cooking all the way from San Francisco that we were able to pre-record and play to kind of kick it off and set the tone for a lunch. And then we also have sent out a very simple virtual kind of package, not a box, nothing expensive, a very simple package that also included a menu from Dominique Kren of something that you can make at home. And so our, our donors really enjoyed that. And we included a, a smoothie. Um, that recipe was outlined by our founder, Evelyn Lauder, in the, in the packet. And so, um, you know, just things that kind of really resonate, resonate with the audience and stay true to who you are. For our mission-related content, we did another symposium. It was pre-taped and pre-recorded. We had scientists come together and talk about our mission. And then I think the key, two key pieces for this change on this event is that we added in the seating and virtual table component. So when we sold the tables, donors were allowed to invite nine other guests in addition to themselves to join them at a virtual table. You actually joined the virtual table after the program and not during the program because we were not able to do that during the, with the technology. But um, it really worked out well. People enjoyed sitting together. They enjoyed interacting and seeing each other. So that was a great opportunity. The other piece um, and where that $817,000 in on-site revenue came from was a text to pledge functionality where you can text in a gift and a message could be displayed along with your name and your amount. And this was a customization that we did to the platform we were on and they, they did love us um, and all of our customization requests, um, but it allowed donors to kind of see each other, see the gifts being made, um, kind of create some momentum. You can do a gift in, in tribute to the honoree. You can do a gift in honor of the individual being honored at that event or also just saluting your table host, right? You know how many guests come 
and they are not technically buying the ticket, but they're coming as a guest of someone. If they see other guests at the table, maybe making a gift in honor of their table host, they might actually do the same. So it's kind of a momentum builder. Uh, the key piece of this is that we secured two large challenge gifts. So they were matching gifts that came on at a certain point during the video program. We did the first challenge pretty early on, I would say within the first 12 minutes of the program where a, a kind of a slide came on and it said, we're delighted to announce that this donor would like to match up to this amount of money over the course of this program. Would you kindly join them? And so that really kind of galvanized the group. And we also secured some pace setter text pledge, text to pledge gifts. Let me explain what a pace setter text to pledge gift is. So we went back to our grateful donors that used to raise their hand, kind of the old fashioned paddle raise um, during the event and give money directly to the mission. And we went back to some of them and said, you know, in the past you raised your hand and gave this gift for research. Might you consider texting in a gift of a similar size during the event? We're happy to take down your amount your message and your name and go over how you'd like it to appear. And we can preload that into the system. So you don't have to be worried about getting your phone out and texting, we're gonna help you out. And we did that for about 19 donors and we preloaded their text messages. And we were able to use that at certain points throughout the programming in conjunction with the messaging on the screen. And it really did, um, we think, help motivate others to give as well. So I think that's kind of a, the recipe to our secret sauce after we kind of had a few events down under our belt. And I'll turn it over to Rebecca to tell you about the next one we embarked upon. Thanks, Lucretia. So shortly thereafter, we had our Boston virtual luncheon. So Boston is one of our most committed regions uh, with the, the one of the highest concentration of research dollars that the organization funds directly in Boston. This constituent group is deeply devoted to science. And again, we were tasked with how can we incorporate the personality and the priority of this group into the virtual event. So the total revenue that we raised was 284,000. We had budgeted 250, so we were pleased with where we landed with that. We had about 350 attendees, and our initial intent was to pre-record content and to have a live symposium with the researchers who we highlight as part of this event. Ultimately, we decided to pivot the symposium to be pre-recorded just the week of the event. And I say that for a few different reasons here. So the first being that ultimately the platform needed to do a few different aspects of functionality that ultimately we decided to be thoughtful about and I'll tell you why. So first is the platform needed to first show the pre-recorded video, meaning all the pre-recorded content, then transition to a live feed with the four panelists, each in their own individual areas, own separate internet speeds, own separate firewalls, all different things to be mindful about. And then thirdly, then transitioning to virtual tables following the program and the symposium. Ultimately, we analyzed the risk versus the reward. And we had listened to the feedback from all of the other events prior. Something that stuck out to us was that no one commented that the events weren't actually live or versus pre-recorded. We had been thoughtful throughout the process and in our scripting that it felt live. We consciously wanted it to feel holistic and that it was happening in real time. So we made the decision to ultimately pre-record the symposium. Another compelling component of this in-person event is a survivor to survivor conversation. And it was important for us to also carry that over to the virtual event. This was also the 10th anniversary of this event specifically. So it was important to us to highlight the great work that this community has done over the last decade, but not to do it in a contrived way. We also utilize the text to pledge feature that Lucretia spoke about earlier. And one of the wonderful things that came out of this specifically as the weather warmed up a little bit and certain restrictions lifted, there were certain folks who felt comfortable having their own independent viewing parties outside. We've heard from our community year over year that this is a wonderful day where folks can see each other, see their friends, come together all in the name of research. So there were small viewing parties, again, COVID compliant, all socially distanced, um, and those were handled independently. So it was nice that that could be an added component 
of the day. Lucretia, I don't know if you want to speak about our young professionals. Absolutely. Thanks, Rebecca. So just to keep us on our toes, we did another event with a completely different type of format. So this event called the Pink Agenda is managed by a separate group. It's a separate 501c3. And so it is more of a young professional millennial based audience all across the country galvanized to also raise money for breast cancer. So we did use a different production team, a different platform. We had a much lower budget for this format of this event. And I think throughout Rebecca and I, based on the events that we were overseeing, rotated the platforms, rotated the production teams, rotated just, you know, kind of get to mix it up um, and based on budget constraints. So this event in particular used to be a cocktail style format. And we were able to bring together all of the different chapter cities for the Pink Agenda organization. So typically we had events in Boston, Atlanta, and New York, and they came together for one night to do an event and they raised $263,000. It's typically a ticketed event. There's not as many sponsors involved, but we had over 600 attendees and we were delighted because the cost of the production of this event was so low compared to what was to produce three in-person events that was really economical and the ROI was awesome actually. So the one aspect that was really creative and I give kudos to the, to the Pink Agenda staff team on this is that they had two ticket levels. So they had a VIP pre-show for the table buyers and for the higher level tickets. And they had a really creative live cooking demo in a restaurant in New York City, as well as a preset kind of a, a dance set with DJ D Nice, who is from Club Quarantine. I think many of you might know his name now. Um, he's been doing some great parties. And so he did some spinning, which actually really, in hindsight, brought up the energy level of people that were watching the event. They got real excited. It was good background music. We did a live cocktail mixing event. So people were making their cocktails, kind of interacting with each other. And so we had a, a, has a nice tone um, during like the cocktail reception portion of the virtual event to get everyone's spirits uplifted. The event in total raised $263,000. And um, it was all in all a very positive experience. So I think the next one is you, Rebecca, as you embarked upon 2021. Thanks, Lucretia. So 2021, we all have a bit of Zoom fatigue, virtual fatigue, as we know all so well. So this was a bit of an opportunity for us to try to think outside the box a bit. The novelty of the virtual world in February now is, has certainly worn off a little bit. And we were kind of, up, we, had, we had been so successful last year that we wanted to continue that momentum and continue to do well this year. So last year was a record-breaking event for this in-person event. We had raised over 1.5 million. So we were trying to think, how are we gonna approach this in a way that we can keep expenses low, we can continue to keep revenue high, how can we maximize the impact and the splash that we would with an in-person event while knowing that the attention span of those tuning in, particularly again, having all being in this world for now 10 plus months has gotten much shorter. So while of course encouraging attendance and fundraising. So one thing I wanna point out, last year was the first time that we had an honoree for this in-person event. This was a way for us to bring, obviously not only increased fundraising in the room, it was important for us to bring an honoree back for this year. We have been very fortunate to have the longtime support of Michael Kors and Lance LaPierre, and we were able to honor them this year. Again, one of the silver linings of, of virtual worlds is in other years, perhaps Michael might have been at Fashion Week. So it was a great opportunity for us to em embrace the virtual world and, and utilize it for all it's worth. Um, additionally, we also sent really thoughtful at-home kits for this event, which included in-kind items from luxury partners. Typically we do a really lovely elevated gift bag at events. So this was a nice high touch point for, for our donors. Again, all products donated, which was very important to us. In advance of the event, we had about 836,000 in revenue. During the event, again, using utilizing text to pledge, we raised another 427,000. That included two significant pay setter gifts at $100,000 each, those being significant motivators in encouraging other folks to donate during the program. Our total revenue was over 1.26 million, which was wonderful. And we had about 400 attendees. Now, something important to note is this is certainly our oldest demographic of all of our donors. 
That being said, we wanted to anticipate all of our donor needs and our team thoughtfully came together, brainstormed of, about all of the possible scenarios and something that we implemented for all of our virtual events up to this point was a level one customer service triage system. So essentially we created an at, 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 staffed by our team, a help desk that could, with a designated phone number and a phone tree set up behind that. So if donors had any issues logging into the event, accessing the event, any technical issues that they could call us directly. Our donors very much, justly so, anticipate a very high touch level from us and have high expectations because that's what we've got done for them over the past several years. So it was important to us to have that level one customer service support line so folks had a place to call. And that phone number was socialized throughout all communications leading up to the event. Um, and again, going back to the scientific content, which is so important for this community, knowing that attention spans are shorter, we had to balance that content with the star power. So the style and the substance and our production partners were wonderful in helping us executing that. Excellent. Thanks, Rebecca. I think it's one thing that Rebecca really nicely highlighted in Palm Beach is, you know, which we did do some of our events is if you do have honorees, it's the opportunity to think out of the box. Is there ever someone international that you've been really wanting to honor and you just haven't been able to get them in town? Or, you know, we really did things strategically when we reached out to Michael. Typically he is in Paris at Fashion Week um, in February. And so we were thrilled that we were able to get him to be able to do this and, and something that we've been wanting to do for a long time. So I think there are some pluses to the virtual world, although we do all miss our, our former reality. But you, you can think about that when you think about honorees and sponsors because it's another type of platform and a different way to engage some people that you've long wanted to engage. So I think we're happy to kind of open it up to, to Q&A and answer as many questions as we can. Awesome, yeah, thank you, Lucretia and Rebecca. We do have a couple of questions and just a reminder for those that uh, do you have other questions, you can submit them in the Q&A box. Uh, but first we have, can you please share the name of the platform that you used for texts to pledge? Also, how did donations appear during the live event? Rebecca, do you want to do that one or do you want me to do that one? Sure, it's up to you. If you want to talk about the vendors, I can talk what's up about the how they populated and the CMS and all that. Why don't you go, go for it? Okay, great. So we've worked with a couple of different vendors, um, one being Text to Pledge, which was wonderful, who's been a longtime partner of ours. The and that's Text to Pledge, just to clarify, Text to Pledge is owned by Sophist. And we're right. happy to connect you if you'd like um, as well. Go ahead, Rebecca, sorry. And then we had a wonderful, um, we had a wonderful team, um, Web Spiders, uh, E2M, who worked with us on developing, um, essentially it was an AI technology bot that they had used for many of their international clients. They worked with us on developing that, it's called their Zoe bot, specifically for fundraising. So essentially what that is, is it's a smart technology that could then, you would, it's like you were having a conversation with a friend via text message. Um, and we would work with them on the script and then once information, there was a template essentially that was used. So we'd ask folks to include their name, a donation amount, and if they wanted a message, they also had the opportunity to remain anonymous. They would then text in that information to a dedicated phone number. They would receive a message back, a confirmation, and then a link to pay. That message that they then wrote was then populated into a CMS, which our team managed and was able to publish at our own accord when it felt right in the program. So based on how we scripted things, there were certain times in the program that we said, okay, we know that we have this pace setter, we wanna publish this now, based on an influx of test, text messages, we then published things as they came in. But um, to answer the question, Web Spiders and E2M were a great partner in helping us with that. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you. Okay, next question. What do you do to retain a particular donor in between events to keep them current to donate to the next upcoming event? Oh, well, that is the art and science of fundraising. So um, stewardship and cultivation, I think it's the fabric of relationship building, um, is the fabric of how you retain donors. Uh, we have very high retention rates on our donors across our markets. I think the beauty in those of us that are, you know, fundraisers by, by trade or, you know, it comes down to the importance of relationship building and having multiple touch points throughout the year. So we do craft you know, a donor communication and stewardship plan. 
throughout the year where we engage donors. We worked hand in hand with our terrific communications team um, at BCRF in between the events to think about other ways where they're getting communications about scientific updates, about progress. And, um, you know, how do you thank donors? You have to thank them, you know, two to three times um, for their partnership. And truly, it's about making a donor feel like a partner and not feel like a transaction. At the end of the day, if you can do that across your donors at different levels, um, you'll, they'll retain. And uh, I think that's the kind of the beauty of, of fundraising for those of us that, that, that love it. Perfect. Next question. How do you get hundreds of people in at the same time for the start of the event? <laughs> Rebecca's laughing, so she'll take this one. <laughs> I'm just thinking of, the, so the way that we broke it up was that there were certain members of our team is what we call it in the production room who were working on the live stream. And then we had our level one customer service team set up and, and separate, right? So our team did a really masterful job in, in all of the communications leading up to the event. So we worked with our specific platform vendors to determine, okay, what browsers are best for this? We did extensive testing. We would assign our team browsers, devices. Are you testing on an iPad? Are you testing on a mobile? Are you on Edge, on your Chrome? We did all of our due diligence in advance so we could anticipate what our specific donor needs were. All of that being said, we tried to provide as much information in advance so the donor could feel empowered. But again, we also then had this you know, customer service line where we had a flow chart of like, okay, if the donor is trying to get in, but they're encountering this issue, you know, how can we help them? So I think the, for the majority of folks, they were able to log into all of our events pretty quickly. But I think that again, that was communicating the best ways and the best, you know, tools for ease of getting into the platform and making it as easy for them as possible. And, and we worked with our production and partners and our platform partners to try to remove any barriers to entry as much as we could. Yeah, I think just to piggyback off that too, I think we were very clear about the start time, right? So I think you have to be consistent in your communication. And so we are very thoughtful in our communications with our donors across the board. We have a communications timeline for when we're gonna communicate tickets being on sale, when we're gonna communicate your password, when we're gonna communicate, like there's a 5 p.m. email, an 8 a.m. email, you know, there's a, a very detailed timeline on the donor communication strategy um, that we use in it after we did May, you know, throughout the rest of the season and just kept honing it. So I think if you, you know, kind of shout from the, the rooftops um, that it's gonna start at this time and then you build in a ramp up. So if the event started at 8 p.m., technically we were live at seven. So we kept our lovely poor, uh, one of our production partners who might be on the call, Batman and Robin, we kept being like, first the clock will start at 30 <laughs> seconds down or it's 30 minutes down, then 45 minutes. And we're like, how about an hour? So between our, our two platforms, um, they bared with us on, on our countdown clock. But we did start that countdown clock about an hour in advance, especially for the events that were in May when people are new to this. So to Rebecca's point for this, this triage system we created, we had a large ramp up time. So if we had high net worth donors you know, I was responsible for certain donors that literally called my cell phone and I'm not the most technically proficient, um, walking them through how to log on. But I said, could you log in at seven or 7.15 so that I can do it with you? But I wouldn't be able to do that at 7.45. So, you know, we kind of built that in to our model so that we, people knew they had ramp up time to kind of get into the event. Um, and that kind of helped us with getting a thousand people. Um, hope that helped answer the question for, for Betsy. Thank you. Okay. Can you talk more about what happened at the tables after the show? Was there any program suggestions, talking points, guests at the tables? Yeah, definitely. So I think there's a couple things on this table aspect and I think it's evolved because I think technology has evolved even in the course of the fall. So the tables were hosted ideally by their table host. We did give them prompt talking points in advance so that they could say like, these are three questions you could use as starting questions to ask your table guests. Some of our major donor high net worth prospect tables, we did kind of help facilitate some introductions. We had a major gift officer if needed in the wings, which we didn't have that many, so one person had to hop around um, if needed to kind of make sure people had someone to help manage the conversation if they needed that. Um, and then we had roughly about 10 to 12 guests per table. Not everybody decided to log in for the virtual table aspect, but they did really like it. And since then, we've also identified another platform literally called Virtual 
tables. So it's actually a platform. Um, there are a lot of production companies in New York that have the license for this platform. But that platform gives you the opportunity to actually sit in your table and watch the event the entire time. So it's actually just kind of even further elevating it. And so that's something that we're, the BCRF is embarking upon this spring is having guests actually sit in a virtual table during the entire event. So you don't have to worry as much about the talking points and managing the content because they'll mostly be watching the program and then they'll be able to chat with each other about ideally what are their favorite parts of the program, how did they get involved in the organization, you know, what brought them to the table. So just kind of those kind of generic questions um, were really helpful, I think, in, in getting everybody set up for success. Okay, well, how do you- I was just gonna say, we'll just add to that for some of our luncheons as well. Typically for the in-person events, it's an added benefit to have a, an investigator sit with the group. So if we're thinking of virtual tables and there is the opportunity to engage someone else outside of the organization or a benefit that someone may have at an in-person event, if it's sitting with one of the researchers, you know, there's something to think about in that sense as well as, as, as we are living in the virtual world. All right. How do you combat Zoom fatigue and convince people to attend your virtual event? All right, Rebecca, you're up next. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> since we've figured that out, I think, I mean, I think that the main thing that, I think we're all feeling that, right? And I think that the main thing that feels authentic to each group is getting the buy-in, quote unquote buy-in of the main stakeholders of each region, right? So you know, we're working with our co-chairs, we're working with our committees, what do they want to see? And also asking, there's no one who's, there's no one who knows their community better than the people who are living in it. So they see what other organizations are doing. They see what's resonating with them. They see what's resonating with their friends. We'll have donors that say, oh, I watched this event and they did X, Y, and Z, and that was really boring. Or, you know, have we thought about this? So I think really working collaboratively as a team you know, and, and working with our communities to see what works. I also think, you know, being creative and working with some of our creative production partners has been really, has been really helpful. I think it's easy to think um, as, you know, as many events as we've done and continue to do that, you know, you know it all and, and that, you know, this is business as usual and it's not, it's continuing to evolve. So I think tapping into resources continually and being fluid and being able to adjust is really important. Um, and continuing to, you know, depend on others is, is, is really important during this time. And I, think you, I, mean, I think you also, and I think Rebecca, you, you answered it correctly. I think at the end of the day, you have to remind the donor of the mission, right? They right. don't have to attend, like they're not required, but it is a 100% tax deduction. Correct. We literally splashed it across our forms. And so, you know, if you're not giving them any goods and services or any gifts, you know, in whatever for attending or mailing them, then your get, get event is 100% tax deductible. So at the end of the day, if you can say like our mission, we have to feed these people, we have to deliver this service, please, will you stay with us? You know, we still need you in light of COVID. You know, if you're able to talk to a donor about the focus and the purpose of this event, they don't have to come. But I think we had a lot of donors that said, okay, fine, I'll send you my donation. I'll think about coming. So fine, that's okay. Um, and then hopefully you kind of call them back and say, so-and-so is joining us. Do you want to come now? And sometimes they just feel guilty, but they feel bad you keep calling them. So I think it just, you know, depends on the donor, but I think you have to go back to the mission and remind them that even during COVID, there are services that your organization has to deliver and you need them. These are a partner of yours. And so it goes back to the stewardship cultivation strategy. If a donor feels like you need them, and hopefully they will be with you when you do. Okay, so the next question. For the breakout tables for your New York luncheon, what platform did you use? Was it Zoom? Would love to know how you were able to create the experience and bring people back together for the global program, all while creating a live virtual event. You may have already touched on this, but wanted to read it. Yeah, so I think for the New York event, we did, Rebecca mentioned, we did use a program called E2M Web Spiders. Um, but there are a number of platforms that do do this virtual table format um, for the spring of 2021. We're also working with a company actually called Virtual Tables. So uh, if anyone wants contact information for any of our vendors or partners, you can definitely just contact Rebecca and I offline and we're happy to make introductions and you can chat with all of these great experts that we've been privileged to work with. Okay, 
Do you think sending food baskets ahead of time so they feel like they are part of an in-person gala event uh, or, or then when what, is, sorry, let me make sure I can read this correctly. Do you think sending food baskets ahead of time so they feel like they are a part of an in-person gala or what incentives do you give at various table levels aside from shout outs or donor contributions listings? Sure. So it's interesting. I think that a lot of organizations are now trying to replicate that in-person gala feel, right? And that includes including those at-home dinner kits for sponsors at a certain level, maybe not all attendees, but above a certain level, right? There's a few things to think about. That no longer makes the gift fully tax deductible as Lucretia mentioned before. So they now are receiving goods and services. So their donation essentially would be less. That's something to be mindful of. Some organizations are now enabling the donor to go directly to the vendor and paying for that meal separately, which is fine, of course, but then there's all of the logistics that need to be coming into place about that. We've recently had this conversation with, with a group that we're honoring and the feedback that they gave, which was interesting to think about was if I'm having dinner, they had received dinner from another organization. And when they received the dinner, it was cold and it wasn't necessarily what they would have wanted. And you know, because it had been packaged, it was essentially like a takeout dinner. They basically said, you know, if I'm making dinner, I'm either having wanting it to have it catered or if I'm gonna make a special dinner for my family. This isn't the same as me being in a ballroom. This isn't the same as me being with 10 other guests. So it's something to consider. I think that each organization has to do what's right for them, but I think the tax deductibility and the ability to execute it in the way that you would an event are two things to consider. Yeah, I think also too, I think a lot of people have done it really successfully with really creative like popcorn and smart things um, that you can control. You have to know your donor base too. I mean, we are very cautious about cost. So um, being mindful of the ratio of expense to revenue is very important. So, you know, sending a box with X dollars of postage on the outside would probably offend our donor base. So I think it really matters on who your donor base is. I saw a great gift box sent out by a wonderful nonprofit in New York City that was completely underwritten by a sponsor. So when you got that box, you're like, they didn't call the nonprofit anything. A sponsor has paid for this, has packaged it, and has sent it. In a way, you know, as long as the, the nonprofit is not giving away your address, but that's a whole other story. But as long as the donor confidentiality is maintained, I think if you're able to get the box underwritten, it's a different feeling, but I think you have to be thoughtful about what you're sending because you can't control, to Rebecca's point, temperature of food, quality of food. So what else creative things can you send in a box that makes it kind of fun? And so we have not really, we're not the best people to talk about levels of boxes because we do really try to play it more on the cost effective side, but we have seen some great stuff out there. So it's possible. Okay, one more question so far. Uh, do you see Breast Cancer Research Foundation hosting virtual events in place of live events in the future? And if so, can you outline the pros to that? Okay, so I'll answer it. I think, um, I think maybe across the industry and across the sector, everyone's trying to figure out the best thing to do. Um, I think what people are looking at is the added value of the virtual component and who you're reaching that you haven't been able to reach before. So that has to look at from a cost benefit analysis. So of the new donors, of the new constituents, how many are you reaching? How much are those people giving? Does it make sense to maintain this? I think really, in, if we're being strategic and thoughtful about it, we're looking at a hybrid event model for many years to come. I think there will be ideally one day when we can come back in person, an aspect of an in-person event, but that will also include a hybrid model. And so I think as you talk to vendors, I really encourage you, to ask the question when you're looking at the platform, do you have the capacity in the future to do hybrid events? And it's something that we have been asking about because we wanna work with vendors that are thinking forward to having a kiosk in a ballroom. So what does it look like when you have X amount of people in a room and X amount of people online? And how do you create content for both mediums, for both in the person and online? I think the world we're going to, there's an aspect of virtual that people are embracing. Some people may not wanna get up, get dressed anymore. They might wanna come back to New York. They might wanna stay wherever they are, Florida or Aspen or wherever they, they found themselves. It might be a different world post COVID. 
And how do you bring them all into the fold? How do you keep getting their support? And how do you continue to reach everybody? So we just, I think we'll have to see how the world evolves. But I think in theory, we're best case scenario, we're planning for a hybrid modeling is the safest bet um, going forward. All right, that is perfect timing. So we only have a couple minutes left. So uh, I am going to answer one other question or read out one other question for you. How can we keep in touch with you for consulting? Uh, and Lucretia and Rebecca, I know that you'll be okay if we share your information in the follow-up email that we send out to everyone, as well as you can see it on the screen now. So with that, uh, I am gonna let Rebecca, Lucretia say any last words that they want, and then I will wrap it up and, and let everyone have a good rest of their afternoon. Well, we want to say thank you to everyone that joined. We know we have some, some loyal friends and supporters and vendors and partners that came together to this. So thank you to all of you, not only for um, joining us today, but also for your expertise. And I think we just want to say, you know, it's challenging. I think when we embarked upon this in May, we didn't know what we were undertaking. But, you know, you have to learn. You have to try. I think it's an opportunity to embrace a new medium to learn something new and to learn more about your audience. Like, who are your donors? Uh, and I think Rebecca nicely took talked about you know her the boston community it's boston strong i think as someone might have put in the chat there um you know talk to your co-chairs talk to your committees and ask them what they'd like to see i think it's a new opportunity for you to engage people i guess they always say if you want money ask for advice so i would just say um continue to ask for advice from your donors from the people that you know that have your best interest at heart and uh don't be afraid um, donors want to give, they just want to be asked. So enjoy, have a great day. And Rebecca, if you want to add anything. No, thank you all. This has been obviously over the last year and, and continue to do so. The need to partner with folks and learn from each other is more important now than ever. So thanks to everyone who joined today and we're thrilled to be, be with you. Yes, thank you so much everyone for joining us. Rebecca, Lucretia, thank you so much for your time today. And I hope that everyone has a wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.